Uh, well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Christopher Lane, uh, and my co-presenter today is Alex Crane. Um, we are both members of the Enterprise Architecture team um, with Chick-fil-A, um, and we're going to talk about uh, GitOps in the real world, um, improving the um, developer experience, uh, and this is based on our experiences uh, managing Chick-fil-A's uh, customer-facing digital properties. So first, a little bit about who uh, Chick-fil-A is. Uh, we are a privately owned quick service restaurant based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Chick-fil-A began with a simple idea from our founder, Truett Cathy, uh, to fill the needs of his customers, the Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich, very famously. Um, we've grown from that uh, idea to more than 2,400 restaurants, uh, mostly in the U.S., but we've opened locations in Canada and Puerto Rico in the last few years. Um, our per-restaurant scale is significant. Uh, we have by far the highest per-restaurant uh, sales in the QSR industry. Um, currently, more than 20% of revenue is flowing through uh, our digital channels. Our mobile app, Chick-fil-A One and Chick-fil-A.com drive the vast majority of these sales, um, and we've seen significant growth in these channels uh, since March 2020 when the impacts of COVID started in North America. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about what our um, uh, back end looks like for our digital properties. We, we call that uh, back end DXE for the digital experience. Um, and this is the number of requests uh, through DXE on a given day. There's nothing special about this day. I just picked a recent one. <laughs> but all the times are US Eastern, but the, problem, the pattern probably isn't terribly surprising. So there is uh, the request ramp, ramp up um, during breakfast. Uh, there's a spike um, uh, at the peak of the lunch rush. And finally, we hit another smaller peak during dinner. Um, if we're running a national or regional promotion, uh, these numbers can easily double. Um, but on average, we hit about uh, 300,000 requests per minute at peak. Um, we average about 120,000 requests per minute um, over the day, and we service about 330 million requests total. Um, so the DXE team uh, behind these services is composed of a bunch of developers, <laughs> both internal and uh, uh, internal staff and external contractors. Um, together, this team uh, pushes thousands of commits and opens hundreds of PRs every single day. Um, I really like this GitHub Insight graph because it looks like we have no issues, <laughs> uh, which of course we do, um, but we just track them elsewhere. Uh, but our application platform is entirely based on GitOps, um, so all of our developers need to transverse traverse uh, our, this process uh, to get their code deployed. Um, we have no blackout times where we prevent deployments, so we need this process uh, to smooth uh, flow smoothly at all times. Um, Alice is going to explore a little bit more about what we discovered uh, using GitOps at our scale, um, but I think it's helpful to set a little context. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, what the DXE ar architecture looks like um, and the GitOps process behind it. So this is a high-level DXE architecture. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Um, uh, requests from CFA1, um, Chick-fil-A.com, and other digital properties are routed to our services running in EKS. Uh, we have clusters in both um, US East 1 and US West 2, um, though uh, the latter is mostly for failover. Uh, the setup is the same in, in both regions, uh, and we regularly route all of our traffic to US West 2 to make sure there aren't any hidden dependencies in there. Um, our services are mostly uh, Java, Spring Boot applications with uh, some mixture of Go and Python apps. Um, the apps are backed by global Dynamo DB tables. Um, the data in Dynamo is a, a stream to a set of Aurora databases for real-time analytics. Um, the app data from both Dynamo um, and the analytics uh, databases are um, streamed to our S3 back data lake. Um, and the digital born orders, so digital, the orders that start, start um, with uh, Chick-fil-A.com and CFA1 are combined with the traditional orders um, so that our analytics teams have a complete picture of what's going on um, from any given day. So uh, this is uh, the architecture of our application platform. Um, this is what is running all of the DXC services. Um, we think of CAP as our CFA flavored distribution of K8s. Um, it's composed of a series of la layers that collectively form the complete platform. Um, this certainly isn't the entire list <laughs> of components of CAP. Uh, the slide would basically be unreadable if we add them all. But this is how we think of CAP. 
um, in this layered approach. Um, and the layers are meant to be composable. Um, so that uh, platform teams are free to add or remove components to taste, but if they don't want to worry about it, CAP has opinionated defaults, um, and you know you'll get the you'll get those opinionated defaults. But it does allow flexibility for teams to switch things out, say um, the GitOps operator for a custom one or a different one, things of that layer. But uh, the base layer is is EKS um, on top of oops, sorry, that. I go back. There we go. Uh, the base layer is EKS. Um, on top of that is the, the sys layer, which includes things like IAM roles for service accounts, uh, external DNS for managing Route 53 entries, the AWS load balancer to manage the ALBs that form our front door, uh, the cluster auto scaler, and a whole uh, a suite of metrics and uh, providers for both the, the cluster and services. Um, on top of that is our core layer. Um, this includes things like Argo CD, which is really the, the hub of the entire GitOps process. Uh, the Prometheus and Grafana stack, which we're using Prometheus operator for. Um, we're using Thanos operator for um, managing uh, long-term storage of those metrics. Um, and then finally, a tool we're very excited about, SpeedScale, which uh, we use for capturing traffic in one environment and replaying in another. Um, the SpeedScale folks are here today if you'd like to talk to them a little bit, but um, we're, we're excited about that. Um, and the, the, the top layer is our app layer. Um, and we draw a pretty distinct line between what CAP manages and what our dev teams manage. Um, so CAP manages the K8, Sys, and Core layers, and the dev teams manage the app layer. Um, so what do the dev teams need to do to actually deploy? And so this is our deployment process at a high level. Um, uh, let's, uh, there's a lot going on here, so let's walk through it um, and uh, see what um, it's composed of. So the process has started kind of as always by a developer <laughs> pushing a commit to the mainline development branch. Um, this triggers the dev workflow in GitHub Actions. We moved over to GitHub Actions uh, last year from Jenkins. Um, the app container is built. All tests are run, and we'll assume a happy path here and that they all pass, um, and the image is pushed to Artifactory. Uh, next, the workflow pulls the base manifest from, uh, for the app from our customized repos. Um, and our customized repos are our set of repos that we've developed that contain our standard ma manifests for various applications. So, uh, you know, Java API, Go API, Python API, React app, all of those are stored within these set of customized repos. Um, and the base manifests are merged with any app-specific overlays found in the app repo at this point. Um, developers are free to patch anything in the standard manifest, but we offer sane defaults that work for most use cases, um, and this provides kind of an easy on-ramp for developers um, to get uh, started quickly and increase their K knowledge incrementally um, and change things as they need to without having to wade through um, a gigantic pile of, of YAMP. <laughs> the, uh, the complete merge manifest are then committed um, to a special repo we call the Atlas. Uh, this is the, the, the repo that Argo CD is synced to. Um, it's watching for changes on the branch um, of the Atlas, and um, anytime there's a change, Argo pulls down those changes and applies them. Um, so whew, that's a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm going to hand it over now to Alex to discuss uh, what I've experienced and what we've learned using this approach at scale. Thanks, Christopher. Um, and I will probably uh, hop skip through the slides a little bit since we have, uh, I think we're still going to run up on a similar time stop that we had before the uh, um, kind of the interlude there. Um, but uh, so kind of one quick slide here. Um, you know, this is kind of the simple version, right? You've got uh, users contributing stuff to the Git repo. Uh, you have what I put up here as a black box, so hopefully you do actually know what is occurring in there, um, and then applying it to your target environment. Um, so Christopher kind of showed the the real version, right? You know, we we sell this to uh, directors, etc. This is what it's going to look like, and then we know it's going to look like what Christopher showed. Um, so I'll jump right into some pain points, and then go to a kind of a couple examples that kind of show these things. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so it's GitOps, right? And actually, it was great. This panel covered like 50% of what we wanted to cover in the slide deck, so that was fantastic. Um, but uh, you know, so it, it's YAML, right? So it's YAML, it's in Git, we know what's there, it's auditable, um, all of those great things. Like you can merge it, you can see what changed, see all of that. However, users going in to edit stuff, right? You have a massive 
uh, well, at least for us, we have a big gap in terms of the different users who need to deploy stuff or change a config, right? Some of that's people who do it constantly every day, and they know all of it. And then you've got others who only know, or who deploy less frequently, right? They don't remember what all the options and um, you know, field values are for all of the different pieces of YAML. And today's kind of deployment YAML or similar has a lot of different choices, but depending on what you've added in your cluster, that's in a lot of separate documentation. Um, so, you know, um, how do you do, you know, do you do the pull request validation and testing? That catches some of it, uh, but that's not terribly proactive to the user, right? They, they do it, they submit it, then they find out. It's almost like the mainframe days, but I mean, better and faster, hopefully, but uh, still a little bit delayed. Um, you know, so, you know, what are some solutions, you know, for some of that? You know, IDE plugins as well, right? You can do all that linting, front load all that. Um, and that's good, but some of the users still aren't kind of IDE people, right? I mean, think about today, some people are command line people, some people like web UIs, some are love doing it in the IDE. Um, and kind of the other piece there is, uh, and again, as was mentioned in the panel, um, AWS, Azure, Google, Argo CD, these groups put a lot of effort into good user experience, directed flows, what needs to be in a menu um, to help users figure out what should be in those files. Um, or what should be in the system. Um, and we kind of lose that, right? We throw that out the window frequently we do GitOps. Um, so kind of, you know, here's an example with the Argo uh, CD UI. Um, you know, most of the issues that we raised before are kind of addressed in this, um, but it, it does, um, you lose audit history of what's here unless Argo separately fully implements that. You lose recreatability, right? Think about anyone who's create, had a team that turned out they created a database or similar through a web UI and a cloud provider, and later on you need to go recreate it, and you got no idea what that state was. Um, you know, uh, an example, you know, with GitOps, um, we've fixed those two problems by doing this in Git. We know the audit trail, we can recreate it, we can repull it, but what are the field values that I can put here? Which ones are not listed in some basic template? Um, where you have things that would be autocomplete, clusters to be targeted, et cetera. Um, you know, you're going, are you, where, how are you looking those up? Are you looking them up separately and filling it out manually, ripe for um, misspellings, typos, et cetera? Uh, usually, you know, you go ahead, you get it as close as you, know, you think, you submit it, and then you wait for things to explode, hopefully in the pull request, but sometimes it gets all over the cluster before you find out that thing is exploding. And hopefully that's also not scary. Hopefully your automated tooling for rollbacks, et cetera, makes that a clean and transparent process. But as a dev, I hate waiting five or 10 minutes sometimes to find out that the thing I deployed actually exploded and they're waiting for a production fix. So getting to some you know, proposed solutions. So one I went ahead and crossed out entirely was the abandoned GitOps in favor of some new model. Um, I just went to GitOps and I really don't want to change. No, I, I think there's a lot of great value uh, found in GitOps and the auditability, what's there. And for those of us that um, are deep in the weeds of some of the stuff, you know, it's really nice being able to be in the guts of it and not pulled out into some menu. Um, but, you know, I, I just think how great it would be um, when we look at UI editing with Git as the data store. If I jump back a few slides real quick, we see in this top right-hand corner, uh, it might be too small to see on the deck, but it says edit as YAML. Right? And a number of cloud providers, a number of other pieces in various places let you see the YAML that backs your thing or the JSON that backs your documentation object. However, kind of your best way to use that as a dev would be it's go fill out the form, then go click edit as YAML, and then go copy and paste that over into the Git repo, right? How nice would it be if it was able to load that from Git as the data store when you went to that menu, and when you hit save, you know, push it back as a pull request so that it could be reviewed. Still hit all that great pipelining stuff that's done behind the scenes, but enable those users who are more UI or visual based, right? But not box out those who do need to go edit something more directly in the repo. Um, and then one other kind of interesting option there is IDE plugins and also command line, right? And those would both, both would and could function similarly. Um, to the UI piece there, but the core part of that being that after you made your changes, done your validation, some of it, it gets committed to Git and is able to follow all the rest of those deployment practices and validations. So, <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, we always like to finish with a quote from our founder, uh, Truett Cathy, and uh, we picked the no goal is too high to climb, uh, or sorry, <laughs> no goal is too high if you climb with care and confidence. 
Um, this is a quote that's particularly meaningful to the, um, the DXE team. We actually named one of our conferences, um, Climb with Care. Um, but, uh, you know, please check us out at uh, our tech blogs, tech post at uh, medium.com at Chick-fil-A tech blog, um, as well as some of our open source projects at uh, github.com slash Chick-fil-A. Um, and as always, we're hiring. So thank you guys. We appreciate the time.